Well, welcome everyone. I uh, hope you have a great audience out there. Appreciate y'all uh, joining us today. I'm John Quinn. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a small launch company called Exos Aerospace. Um, Exos is one of three companies in the U.S. that's licensed to fly reusable rockets. And you might know the other two, uh, SpaceX, Blue Origin. Well, I'll forgive anyone who doesn't know about us because we spend millions to fly like people-sized payloads. And of course, SpaceX and Blue Origin spend billions on school bus size payloads. So apparently there's something to being two of the richest men in the world and has great perks and has a certain level of notoriety that I haven't achieved. So anyway, I would uh, like to uh, thank our coordinators who are on, who made this possible for us today. And also I'd like to welcome my brilliant co-hosts today who are masters in the education world and are helping us to get the word out to this community and hopefully we're gonna engage a whole bunch of you uh, to make this mission possible because uh, it's definitely gonna take a tribe for something like this. So without a further ado, I'd like to go around the room and let our panelists introduce themselves. And first up, uh, Liz Kenick, uh, would you introduce yourself? I'm Liz Kenick. I am president of Teachers in Space. We started in 2010 as a project of the Space Frontier Foundation. We began with a NASA grant that kept us running for about three years, producing professional development workshops for teachers. Then we spun off and became a 501c3 corporation in New York State. Since then, we have been funded first by the Perlin Project and most recently by Blue Origins Club for the Future. We ran workshops this summer in Kansas, New Mexico, and Maine, and we are currently building classroom space flight experiments for launch next year. Absolutely phenomenal work. And wow, to summarize all those years of effort into that little bit doesn't do it justice. Um, but next up, uh, Brandon, tell us about yourself and what you're doing. Yeah, so my name is Brandon Pearson, and I'm the director for a nonprofit called Near Space Education. And we're a spinoff from a little bit more common group that's called Near Space Launch that's been designing and flying small satellites for the past six years. They just celebrated their 100th satellite in orbit and 800th um, subsystem in orbit as well, using a number of the other people that are actually part of this panelist group. But a big part of Near Space Launch has always been the education aspect, coming out of from the university first with helping to launch Indiana's first satellite to going and starting to engage other universities and high schools and those things. So there's a big desire to be able to go and to keep emphasizing the need there is for um, really hands-on and practical STEM education, hence where near space education came from. So we focus on a number of different things relating to going and providing students and teachers with opportunities to really go and to get into the um, education realm in terms of those STEM experiences, whether it be with high altitude balloon launches, satellite launches. There was a couple of thin sat satellite launches that have already taken place with student designed payloads from elementary, middle school and high schools that were kind of led by the universities that took place. But we really focus on providing training for teachers, supplying the equipment would need so that schools can start their own balloon launch programs and also being able to get into outer space and then starting to get into the world of space camps as well, especially as we prepare for the eclipse in 2024. Fantastic. Obviously, great passion um, and getting down even into the lower grades where I believe this really has to start, Brandon. So that's awesome. Um, next up, Jake. Talk to us. Oh, wait, we don't have Jake, do we? Oh, Jake's missing. OK, well, we'll move on to Mike. You're up. <laughs> Cool, thanks, John. I'm Mike Miller. I live in Missoula, Montana. I've been working on supporting small satellite programs for about 16 years. Uh, I've worked with over 100 missions probably, and I'd have to say enjoyed virtually all of them. Um, my background is in engineering. Uh, I've I, I did automation and worked on some of the first computers that were used to automate large industrial systems. Uh, I 
lived different places and done different things. And one of the great things that I do now is I get to work with education programs and help them with the regulatory needs that they have to license their radios and the remote sensors and, uh, and just generally help get the missions into space and, and, and build satellites that work. That's really important to me. And I'm really glad to work with missions like that. Thank you, Mike. The licensing regime. Oh, my goodness. We need more guys like you because, you know, it's almost getting to the point where the rocket science is the easy part. It's getting the launch licenses to get out there and especially to eject payloads. So um, great skill set. Appreciate having you on, Mike. And last up, Mr. Ed Diaz. Come on in. Hey, I'm Dr. Eduardo Diaz, founder and CEO of Advancing X. And my team and I, we train, select and train career astronauts for the commercial space industry. We also uh, provide online training for those who are interested in space and learning more about it. And what are the what are the, some of the do's and don'ts in microgravity environments, research environments? Our board of directors include Dr. So Young Yi, who is an astronaut. She spent some time on the International Space Station as well, which is really cool because she actually works on some of the curriculum for developing how to do research in a um, on Earth, and then of course in microgravity as well. And from there, we are extending our education programs on a global scale. So we engage with different uh, ambassadors around the world. Uh, we're now currently engaging 130 countries. Uh, so it's, it's pretty fantastic. Thank you for having me. That's awesome. 130 countries. I think that's rivaled just about only by the space station, right? I mean, and that's what space is about. You know, we can put aside our differences. And it's just amazing to see that uh, in what we're doing today. So thank you for that, Dr. Ed. All right, so I'm a former Navy submariner. Process and procedures are near and dear to me and our processes always start out with like casting a vision. So I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the three-step mission that uh, brought us together here for this conference. First, what we want to introduce is a space CubeSat competition into the National Science Fair. And, you know, I looked up, you know, I went to the most valuable resource we have, Google, right? And I Googled National Science Fair competition. And I looked back and the 10 top experiments were the ones that I did. And I hate to say it's like decades ago when I was in school. And with all the opportunity we have today, whether it's uh, for balloon flights or suborbital flights or even orbital flights now to get into space with where our economy is going, I think our National Science Fair has got to embrace this. So ultimately, what we'd like to have, and I know we won't achieve it this year, but it is our high bar that we're setting here, um, is we'd like to have all 50 states on a single suborbital flight uh, going to space. So all the winners from all the states across the US, and I'd love to expand this uh, as Dr. Ed has across the world, where we're flying payloads every year on worldwide competitions. But for right now, we'll try not to boil the ocean. We'll just pick off this small piece of getting 50 states uh, CubeSat Challenge competition winners on a rocket. And we're starting this off, uh, hopefully targeting 10 plus for 2023 uh, when Exospace launches. Probably its third launch of the vehicle you see hovering behind me um, in quarter three of 2023. So today, I know Liz, you have like three states um, that you've pioneered and gone into. Um, so tell us a little bit about those three states and a little bit of what they're doing. Sure, so if it's okay, let me share my screen and show you something about what we have been doing. Let's see if I can make this work now. Do you see my slides? Yes. Awesome, okay, so yeah, Teachers in Space, launching our path to space. On the left, the Blue Origin, New Shepard rocket. We began suborbital flights with them. Our first launch was in 2019. We have four more 2U payloads going up with them early next year, which will carry the experiments built by the teachers and their students, the teachers who went through this summer's workshop program in New Mexico, Kansas, and Maine, 
We also had a Chicago teacher attend the main workshop. If we get Chicago experiments, we'll include those. So that's where we're going immediately. This is something we just began right in the middle. You see on the left, young woman Zoe Smith is a 12th grade AP physics student in Gloversville, New York. And on the upper right corner, the gray haired man is Chris Murphy. He's the teacher. The two of them got a flight with zero gravity just this month when zero gravity called me up on a Wednesday and said, hey, can you get me a teacher and a student? I was like, okay. And this is who we found and they got to fly. Super exciting. We're going to fly additional teachers with experiments in November, one from Forest Hills, New York. He teaches astrophysics at the high school level, as well as science and space science and earth science. That's Joel Jackal. Then we also have a teacher coming from Maine, and we have a teacher coming from Wisconsin. And all of them have experiments that they'll be flying. And this is an ongoing program. So we're super excited because we're teaching the teachers what they need to know to be the payload, to prepare the payload. It's more complicated than flying on a balloon, but not as complicated as flying suborbitally. It's a really great step and it's a whole lot of fun. So that's an ongoing program for us. Firefly, you see just beyond the picture of the zero G folks. They are trying again, right? They put up their first alpha rocket last year, 2nd of September, we had our 3U first orbital educational payload on there, that's a CubeSat. And unfortunately, two minutes up, there was an issue with one of the engines. They had to destroy that rocket. We lost our payload. They're trying again. The current launch window, there've been some issues. There've actually been some hurricanes off the coast of California. But the current launch window is the 30th of September with a backup on the 1st of October, just after midnight, spectacular middle of the night launch. I'm going, I'm taking a teacher from Maine, two teachers from Maine, and we will hope to see our satellite go to orbit. Okay, so we began, as I said, in 2010 with a NASA and Space Frontier Foundation cooperative agreement. We reached a hundred classrooms, we launched experiments, we sent them to ISS with the Student Space Flight Experiment Program on Antares in 2014, two launches of Antares. The third one had to be destroyed. So luckily we only had mission patches on that. They were recovered and we were able to relaunch our mission patches a month later with SpaceX and that was successful. This year, 2022 through 2024, we are collaborating with multiple aerospace companies Challenger, Learning Centers, Spaceports, Space Grant Consortia, Space Museums, and we continue to work with NASA. Where do we fly? These are all the places we've flown from the top to the bottom. If they're bold, it means we're currently flying there. So we are continuing the parabolic <coughs> aircraft flights. That's things like zero G. We've also flown in Canada on Falcon 20s, but yeah, we've got teachers who just went and more going in November. High altitude balloons, we have an ongoing program out of Gloversville, New York. Chris Murphy, who just took that zero G flight, is the head of that program. Um, we flew with Blue Origin in 2019, and we will fly again for two U payloads going up on New Shepard early next year. And then we've got the Serenity 3U orbital satellite going uh, with Firefly, hopefully at the end of this month. We have previously done things with ISS. We may do that again. Priorities for our school year, which just started September of now until June of next year, we continue to do professional development workshops for teachers. We have another one coming up in New Mexico in January. We are continuing to help those teachers work with their students to build classroom flight experiments. And we continue to provide real space experiences where they get to attend launches, participate in payload integration, and participate in space flight training. So as I mentioned, the three states that we ran the week-long workshops for this summer were New Mexico, Kansas, and Maine. And these are typical 1U CubeSats. You see sixth graders in Syracuse in the upper left. You see the Perland Stratospheric Glider in the lower left set world records in altitude while carrying our 1U experiments, which you see in the middle. In the bottom are some students at 
Forest Hills in Queens, New York, Biggest High School in New York, working on their CubeSats. And on the right is that balloon program from Gloversville, New York. Okay, so what's the point? Two U cubes with blue origin are affordable. They're standardized. And at the moment, it's only $8,000 to fly one. I don't know how long that will last, but that is our current price. And that's the price we're trying to get everybody to adhere to because you know what? That equals 4,000 per U, which is less than a lot of people charge for balloons. It's not what we pay for balloons because we know what balloons cost, but there are people who mm -hmm. charge more than that, right? So wow. we first launched um, on New Shepard in 2019, thanks to a NASA flight opportunities funding. And what we did was establish a standard. And so that is what we are currently repeating. That's what we're teaching. That's what we're flying. This is a two U dose, the two dosimeter experiment for radiation. One dosimeter is wrapped in a radiation protection fabric. The other is not. And you see what is the difference on the right. You can see red is unwrapped, blue is wrapped. They look really similar. They track each other, but the wrapped one is protected. Um, on the upper right corner, it was flown on a balloon. It goes up, it comes down. In the lower right, it flew on the Perlan stratospheric glider. That is a seven hour flight because that glider goes up and it stays up. So it's a very different shape of the flight, but you get the same thing where unwrapped sees twice as much radiation as wrapped. So this is a very popular experiment with high schools because it's easy to reproduce. They can build it and then they can do a lot with the data that comes out of it. Okay, so this is just a few hundred dollars worth of hardware, right, Liz? You are right. Yes, a couple hundred dollars worth. Very, very affordable. Isn't that amazing that a school can engage all those different disciplines to put that experiment together? And it's the practical hands on that this program gives. I love it. That's right. And these that's beautiful. Are, We're recording um, to making it all work. They're going inside 3D printed frames, which is what's really amazing. This is the 3U version that's going up with Firefly at the end of the month. I take it that I'm probably over my time. So I just flip through these super fast and then we can talk about more if you want. Here in October last year, we took a bunch of eighth grade and 11th grade students from Gloversville who came up with that 2U radiation experiment and who also run the balloon program for us. We took all these kids to innovative test solutions in Schenectady so that they could participate in a day of engineering and testing and pumpkin smashing. And a New York State <laughs> Senator came and we got a whole lot of press coverage. So that was awesome. You see here the New York State Senator in his mask because it was still COVID time and lots of teachers and students looking super happy to be there. Um, next, we have already begun the microgravity flights. Jim Cool on the left in the Final Frontier Design spacesuit, and to his right, Charlotte Kiang was an engineering grad student at the time. She went on to become a program manager at SpaceX and has now moved on to nonprofit work. This is where we first began doing zero gravity flight testing of the Final Frontier Design commercial spacesuit. We were doing this in Canada. We are now moving on to zero G and flying teacher and student built classroom experiments. And there you go. These are our partners. Club for the Future funded us dramatically last year and enabled us to resume producing our summer workshops, which have this year been funded by the New Mexico Space Grant Consortium, the Challenger Learning Center, Cosmosphere in Kansas, and the Maine Space Grant Consortium. Teachers and students can build and fly things. It's time to put them into the science fairs and let them win the flights that they are capable of making use of. Thank you, Liz. Well, our challenge today for everyone in the audience is who thinks uh, you would like to be part of something like this and support and get your state doing these types of uh, these types of experiments uh, out of your state. If you're interested, please jump on the Q&A, give us your name and address and where you're from or name and uh, city you're from and contact email. And we'll add you to a list. We're gonna have a call in probably a couple of weeks and circle back and see if we can come up with a group of people to expand this 
uh, across the U.S. So we'd love to have your feedback, and um, I promise I won't sell your uh, your your email to any of those uh, companies out there. Uh, it'll just be used for our purpose to invite you to a meeting here in a couple of weeks when we figure out when we're going to do that. So awesome, Brandon. Uh, lead on. You're up. Yeah, so I went and one of the things I've had the privilege of doing is I went and actually came into this from an educator originally. I went and I've taught for the past eight years in math and science courses throughout a number of different ages in middle schools and high schools. And one of the things that I saw through that time of education is just the needs for application, not just the acquisition of knowledge, but the actual real world application that needs to be done there. As a student, I found it really easy for me to memorize information. But it was also very dry and boring because I could memorize it and put it out on the test and that's all it was for me. It wasn't until I got to college and started having some opportunities to apply that in real world examples that it really started to make a difference and got me really more excited about what was happening, which is what drove me into education. Once I got into education as a teacher, my passion started becoming of trying to find ways to train students so that they'd be better prepared for either what they're gonna be doing in college or what they're gonna be doing into the workforce later on. And I got involved in all of this because of an opportunity my school had to start a high altitude balloon program where our students would design experiments and over the course of a year would send up multiple balloons collecting and analyzing data. From there, that's where some of the pieces from near space education came in. And what excites me about opportunities like this is that we're going and we're coming out of a time of COVID. We're coming out of a time where students have all the access they need to the information right on their phones. We're trying to find ways to go and how do we get these kids to apply what they're learning? How do we get them exposed to the opportunities that are available? You know, space is this world we think of that, like was mentioned earlier by John, unless you got billions of dollars or your own rocket in your backyard isn't accessible. But that's not the case anymore. It is very, very easily accessible for almost anybody to get to in terms of when it comes to funding, resources, the support out there. It's just absolutely crazy, especially the number of people who are really passionate about seeing students be able to get those opportunities as well. So part of the thing with this program and a lot of us that are passionate about with our own things we do is finding ways to give students and teachers those experiences that are going to help set them apart for when they go and get off into either college or the workforce later on. The National Science Fair is already a really cool opportunity to do that, but why not take that a step further and be able to go and push them and give them a unique opportunity that is still fairly new, becoming more common, but still fairly new across the U.S. in terms of being able to actually go through the engineering process and design those payloads, wire those payloads, put them together in a way, get them up on a rocket, analyze that data once you get back on the other side. Those are the things of the teacher that excite me because it provides the, why does this matter? You know, that question teachers always get, why does any of this matter that I'm learning about? Well, here's the why that answers that because you're getting a real life application to address the problems that all of us are facing right now. The same methods that are being used to test satellites before they go into space are the same ones that students can use to go and collect data. And that's the thing that as an educator and now as this working through this new group with near space education and even as a part of this group here now excites me because I want to see the students get the opportunities that I wish I had more of when I was in high school and that I think are really going to help prepare them and set them apart from their counterparts once they go and get into college. I think you nailed it, Brandon, because I'll tell you, um, we get lots and lots of resumes. Hopefully, we're going into a dramatic hiring phase here real soon uh, as we're closing in on the end of our Series A fundraise. And I can tell you, we've brought 50 people through our doors. And time and time again, the ones that end up coming back for a second interview and ultimately are getting hired as ones who have practical experience, right? And it's it's almost become a key when we look at a resume. Uh, have they done an atmospheric balloon flight experiment? Have they put something on a rocket? Have they sent something to orbit? Um, or is there something in their resume that indicates they've done the hands-on piece? Um, while we have those guys we lock in the back, and we just let them plug on their computers and they don't interface with anyone. <laughs> the guys who actually make it happen are the ones who can take that application 
and they can breadboard their idea and show it and test it and prove it out. Um, so uh, congratulations on what you're doing with getting physical hardware in people's hands. I think everyone on this panel today is a big proponent of that because it's, you know, my old statistic is I heard like 85% of the people learn better uh, with physical hands-on than with just the book in front of them. So uh, kudos, awesome. Well, Ed, um, let me ask you, uh, what about space gets you excited? Uh, thank you. For me, it's, it's the collaboration. You know, um, the opportunity to to work with people across borders. Real reality here is that you know, like for the International Space Station, just in the first word, right? International. It's not just one state or one country. This is a global thing. You know, space is for global access. So from that, I mean, that that's what really gets me excited is this opportunity. I mean, for example, if you were to look at um, actually, let me, let me click on this and share my screen here, if I can. Here we are. Um, if you were to look at the, the, thing, the work that we're doing, when we're working with different uh, people from around the world, we're looking at everything from their health, their environment, their activity level, uh, and all this stuff we put into data, and we take that data and we assess how that's going to apply in, in a team situation in space, right? And so... For me, that, that's super exciting because now we're talking about opportunities where, you know, we get to see where, okay, you have different groups from different environments. They're all going up into space, but they're all coming from different backgrounds and different scenarios, right? So if we better understand their physiology and their psychology, when we take them up to space, we'll better understand how to keep them safe, how to mitigate risks, right? So that for me is very, very exciting. So when you look at all this stuff, like for example, we have licensed technology from NASA in terms of AI that looks at um, your eyes and your facial expressions and things like that when you're working on, uh, let's say you're controlling a rover or you're controlling some type of machine. So we take uh, that technology, we've combined it with our biosensor technology, right? And you take all this and combine it with psychology as well. And we're really able to start looking at the, the, the deep understanding of the individual and the whole entire team, you know, because the reality is it's not just one person out there. You know, and all the people that are working to support that entire team in space, they contribute to the, the performance of these teams working in space. All that stuff comes back to Earth, right? So when you look at all these applications where we're really getting down to the nitty gritty of health and performance and we're looking at it in space, it's a very, you know, some of the stuff we do, a lot of stuff we do is controlled environments. But when you're in space and you learn something new, we can take that information and bring it back down to Earth and say, okay, well, now we better understand why this is occurring with these different people, right? And so when you have these groups that are working together, uh, let's say, for example, in the United States, we've got this opportunity for all these students in high school, as an example of what we're working on here in this, in this group, you have these students that get to produce um, projects, research that's going to go up into space. Well, imagine if they're able to work with other students internationally as they develop these things. You know, they're learning more than just a project that is that is going up in space. Learning skill sets about social communication, right? That that big, huge understanding. That's what gets me excited. All these interconnections, all this social activity. I mean, there it all is in a nutshell, right? So yeah, there it is. You know what's amazing? Um, something you said right in the middle. You said, we start with NASA licensed technology and then we add our piece onto it. So you're taking millions and millions of dollars of research and something that NASA has said, oh, you know, this is great. It's paid for by the taxpayers. Let's get it out there. And at Exos, that's one of the things we do. We don't develop a whole bunch of new things because there's huge costs and huge overheads, but the government's already done it. We can go out and get a licensed NASA technology literally for nothing and then go use it with something else. Of course, we all paid for it already, but use it with something else in a different application. And we've leapfrogged literally jumping forward decades in what we can do. And there are kids out there in high school that are working on a spirit experiments that we couldn't have imagined, but they're standing on the shoulders of years of NASA effort to get the component that makes what they're doing possible today. So I love that and uh, love that you mentioned that. All right, uh, Mike, can you share an experience uh, that might have changed the way that you look at space? Thank you, John. Uh, I, I, 
actually, uh, John let me know that he was going to ask me this question. So I had a little time to think about it, but uh, my preparation wasn't maybe as complete as it should have been. And I ended up with three or four different things that changed the way I look at space. So I'm gonna just recount those. Uh, awesome. Appreciate, uh, as part of my work, I, I work with, um, I work with federal agencies and corporations and universities and public education institutions, uh, all of them. Uh, and one of the things I want to say, even before before I get started on my impressions, just briefly, uh, I, I thought that that Ed's comments were really interesting and cogent on leverage, the sort of leverage that that building on top of the, the millions of dollars and the thousands of person hours that go into developing the technology and bringing it forward. My experience with the missions I work on, uh, I have benefited from a different sort of leverage. And this is from the perspective of a fellow who, uh, in, in our family, my wife has spent a career as an educator in the public education system. And I've been an engineer and it's been clear to me that I have the easier job. And uh, the, the, uh, I understand the tremendous effort that it takes from educators to bring a student through the system. And that is, is at no time more challenging than today. So I'm gonna say thank you because I have in the people I work with, in the schools, in the university systems, the student project leaders, and in uh, the industry, both the recent graduates and more experienced people, I have the benefit of leverage of the thousands of hours that you have collectively put into preparing these young people for the careers that they pursue. And uh, I, you know, I am generally these days the old guy in the room and the perspective of the old guy is generally that, uh, well, they don't make them like they used to, or these kids don't understand. These kids understand more than I ever did. And uh, not only, not only technically being prepared, as was pointed out by John, uh, by their pre prior experiences in education with, with hands-on and exciting projects that they prefer, they have pursued. Also, they they are prepared with what I consider the most essential skills of collaborating, of working together as a team. I cannot imagine the students I went to college with <laughs> behaving in that collaborative and positive and productive fashion. Uh, you are producing outstanding people both in terms of character and ethics and ability to work together as well as in their technical preparedness. Uh, yeah, I am the beneficiary of that leverage. I appreciate it. Uh, the project wouldn't go nearly as well except for the work that you've done. So thank you for that. All right. So if there's if there's any time left, I'll say something about what changed the way I look at space? All right, I'll give you three quick ones. First, uh, I retired from uh, doing the engineering work I'd done in California. I moved back to Montana, the town of 600 people, my hometown. It's where I grew up. I graduated in a class of 17 people. And once again, I have the benefit of educators that I did not appreciate for decades afterwards, but eventually I have come to that. and. Uh, I came back to Phillipsburg uh, thinking I would pretty much left my technical life behind and I would do things like ride motorcycles and cut firewood. However, one day uh, through an unlikely series of events, I was walking down the street of this uh, 19th century town in the 21st century and ran into a NASA engineer. And uh, I won't go into how that happened. But anyway, he recruited me into uh, helping out with STEM education, which I very much enjoyed building a ground station for the students in our, our town to use and communicate with satellites. That was 
that was the first thing that changed my view of space is when I saw that I could actually be in it. I had read science fiction stories and been interested in space since I was about 11 years old, but I had never worked in the space industry until I moved back to Phillipsburg, Montana. And met a NASA so, engineer on the street. I love it. Yeah, I, absolutely. I could see, you know, it was, it, it, it was, it was a scene out of, it was a scene that had been repeated on those streets a hundred times since it was a mining boom town in the 19th century. A chance encounter between individuals changed the direction of one of them forever. Uh, in the 19th century, it might have been a gold strike. For me, I struck a different kind of gold. So uh, do we have any more time, John? Um, yeah, you can go on to, I think that was number one. What's two and three? Okay, number two was fast forward from my encounter there on, on Main Street. Uh, fast forward uh, about 18 months. In the meantime, a fellow at NASA had said to me, hey, Miller, do you think you can handle this licensing stuff? We've got a problem. And I said, I'll give it a try. So uh, I did, and we got it licensed, and I went out to Wallops Island, Virginia, to the NASA Wallops Flight Facility where we were launching a 3U CubeSat. And I got to hold in my hand, uh, with gloves on and in the clean room, I got to hold in my hand an object that was shortly going to be in orbit in space. This is incredible. This, is, this was a seminal moment. It really, you feel it when you say, good luck, little guy. <laughs> So, uh, and, and not only that, it was gonna be transmitting my call sign, my amateur radio call sign from space. This is, nobody gets to do this, but I did. So that really changed my view of space. Okay, and number three, number three, and I'll quit there, is when I got to hold an object that had been in space and returned. Yeah. Absolutely. And you could you could feel the space in it. You could say <laughs> this object has been there. It's done. It's it, there is you know if you if you anthropomorphize like I obviously do a little bit, then you say you know these objects carry with them something of where they've been and what they've done, and that is an amazingly cool thing to say. This has been in space, and I can touch it. Anyway, my three experience, my three moments, I'll shut up so, now. Thank you for that. And you reminded me of oh, half a dozen different stories I have, of course, but you, you particularly got me on one. So I've got a, yeah, it's kind of hard to see it without the good background, but a CubeSat here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a CubeSat. Anyway, you can imagine it. Um, and on this particular launch that you see the rocket going up behind me, uh, we had a biomedical payload on board. And it was the third cancer experiment that we had done uh, for this particular university. And 20 minutes after the rocket has landed, so about 35 minutes after launch, the rocket's landed, it's back on the ground, we pulled the payload a section apart, and I'm handing an experiment off to the president of our company. And I said, get in the cart and get this back to the, the clinic guys um, because it was on ice and it was obviously uh, biomedical and sensitive and timing was important for them to analyze the changes in those cells uh, after it had gone through the microgravity. And uh, as I hand it off, he says, what is it? And I said, oh, that's our cancer cells experiment. And he hesitated for a second. <laughs> But there's something about that space hardware, something that's been out there. And think about the fact that we can return that. Now, I'm all for uh, orbital payloads. And you know, uh, SpaceX put 65 payloads out for universities at once. The sad part is 30, 20, 30% of them failed. And they learned that they did something wrong, but they didn't learn what. So balloons. Um, atmospheric experiments, suborbital, especially suborbital reusable, where you get the experiment back, 
you know, we could have handed that $125,000 experiment that that university put up back to them and said, you know, this has been the space, it failed. And they'd probably find that seven cent capacitor in there that wasn't rated for space, couldn't handle the vacuum. And the next time it flew and went out in orbit, it wouldn't be a piece of space junk for the next couple of years. Um, but they would have been able to fix it, advance it. And I believe that's what all of us want is that, you know, year one, a school has a $500 experiment. Year two, the next students and those teachers are going to build on that. And before long, we're going to have high schools and universities that are doing greater things than NASA has done in the past because technology has advanced. So um, anyone else in the group, uh, raise your hand. I'll call on you guys. Uh, I'd love to know your favorite experiment, favorite thing you've seen um, from our young kids. I know uh, while you're thinking about that, I'll share one. I've got a kindergartner. Uh, that wanted to provide light in space and recognize the fact that you don't have power and all those things, and that's hard. So her idea was she wanted to take uh, what fireflies used to make light. And by the way, you can buy it on Amazon like everything, right? And the firefly juice, and they flew that in space and had a camera on it. But this was a kindergartner came up with that idea. So just amazing. Anyone else have any uh, other experiments? All right, jump in there, Mike. Okay, speaking of that, uh, one of the coolest experiments that I have seen a student team field is light cube. And here's the cool thing about light cube. It's a, it's a one U cube set, it's a little cube, but yeah. it's got a strobe light on it. A strobe light that's so strong that when they set it off, you can see it with your naked eye from the surf, or at least supposedly you can, they haven't launched it yet. But the other cool thing is, besides making the light that you can see, is that if you are an amateur radio operator and you have your handheld amateur radio and you key in the right nine numbers and transmit it, it'll make the light go off. So hmm. think about how cool that would be to go out in your, in your sky at night and you have to do some work. You have to figure out when is it going to be over my house yeah. and what direction should I look in? But if you go through that effort, then you can make the satellite light up. You can do something. Anybody in the world who's got the ability to transmit with a handheld transmitter can make that satellite flash. I think it's really cool. Absolutely amazing. Brandon, I think you had one for us. Well, I've had a chance to go and have some students come up with some really cool ones for our balloon launches that they've done. And one of them that was done by a student who went into aerospace engineering at Purdue now is they were looking at the impact of different types of sunscreens using a variety of UV sensors. So they took a number of different UV sensors, they put them on the outside and the inside of their payload box. And then for a material to apply the actual UV radiation to, her father is a bioengineer who went and had a whole bunch of expired pieces of pig intestine that they use for skin grafts and skin treatments. So they took one of those, they put the screen on, put the sunscreen on that, and then used that as a barrier in between the UV radiation to see if there was a difference between the ones. And there was, they got a different UV radiation reading between the different types of sunscreens that they used. But it was just such a cool connection to see between the common idea they had using other people as well. And then the additional applications that could have been pulled from that in terms of actually analyzing the protein breakdown of that piece of pig skin from what happened to the UV exposure as well. That's awesome. And you hit on a key there. You said, and they analyze the data, which that is a skill set that, you know, when they fly an experiment, they want to see the data. They want to go through that. In math class, you know, I loved math and I didn't care to go through the data, but in industry, the data provides the answers, right? So uh, that's a key part of teaching. And I know everyone on here recognizes that element. So absolutely phenomenal. Liz, did you have a, a favorite experiment you wanted to share about? I do. I talked about it briefly, but I want to go in a little more detail with this. This is that uh, dual Geiger counter experiment. This came from an 11th grade student and his teacher in Gloversville. 
in 2016 when we were sponsored by the Perlon Project. So this was for a one U cube to fly on the stratospheric glider. But what has happened as a result of this experiment, what we learned that we didn't know is that an awful lot of schools do not want to have to do their own research. They're not universities, they're schools, yeah. they're high schools. And they really want textbook approach, things that they can build, that they can replicate, that they can try and see what they come up with. And so this has been a super popular experiment that schools can repeat. And what's really interesting, we've now flown this on multiple balloon flights as well as to the to space and back with Blue Origin on a suborbital flight. And now it's going up on Serenity to stay in orbit for a couple of weeks. But um, if you look at the data that we got back from this, what you see, this weird little spike at the beginning of a balloon flight. We get this spike on balloon flights and on the suborbital flight with Blue Origin, we do not get the spike with Perlin, with the glider. Okay, so what does that say? We've done it repeatedly. It says that this is probably not radiation because I don't think balloons emit radiation, right? I don't think that's what's going on. There's something else happening here. And so talking to some electrical engineers, they think it may be an issue with the way we have built our Arduino and sensor systems. It may be the way that we're drawing power from the vehicle because with Blue, we use a USB and get vehicle data and we replicated that on our balloons. So our balloons now carry their own vehicle payload package with enough power for all the other experiments and our own set of sensors and other people, other schools can plug their experiments into ours, not have to deal with batteries, right? Whereas Perlin, everything is individually powered. There is no vehicle connection. So there are now schools that want to replicate this on zero G on additional flights and see if we can figure out what's going on here. Why did we get this weird spike and how do we fix it? And I love that because that's engineering, that's technology and that STEM and that came from a space flight experiment. And you know, those anomalies are the things that sometimes are the most dramatic result of our whole project. It's not something we expected, but we saw it. And we have some of those in um, primarily our biomedical. When you leave the Earth's atmosphere, everything changes. So the Kármán line is a defining line for more than one reason. And we don't understand why certain changes happen, but they're pretty amazing because we learn more from the things we don't expect sometimes than the things we do. So uh, I'm going to share a couple of slides here. And I'm going to encourage everyone out there in our listening audience to uh, uh, jump on the Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions for anyone on the panel um, about education or space in education or how you can help, uh, obviously, just give us your name, contact information. Uh, let us know where you're from again. We'd be glad to uh, reach out and add you in uh, to our consortium here. And you should be seeing my screen at this point. And there's Exos. And I'm just going to go through a, a typical launch for us. Um, of course, we're one of three. We know SpaceX and Blue Origin. But Exos did it first, actually did vertical takeoff, vertical landing. And today, we don't uh, do a vertical landing. We actually come back under a canopy, as you can see on that left slide, uh, because the canopy weighs about a third of what the fuel weighs. So at our scale, it still makes sense to come back under a canopy. And the, these pictures are all taken by our rocket, so I don't have to give credit to anyone. Um, they are 360, and if you uh, go look at YouTube for Exos Aerospace, you'll find that uh, we have stitched together two 360-degree cameras uh, on our first launch and actually produced where it feels like you're standing in the rocket, and you can even do it with 3D virtual reality headsets. But uh, this is... What the camera was seeing is uh, we lift off of the launch rail. And then, of course, here's just a few snapshots I gathered uh, as we're going through the clouds, which were sitting about 10, 12,000 feet that day, all the way through to the deploy of our drogue, which brings us back into the Earth's atmosphere. You can see it's not even inflated, really, in this first picture on the bottom left. And then as it starts entering and pulling into the atmosphere, you see it start to inflate. 
And then ultimately, uh, we end up under our canopy at about 10 or 12,000 feet coming back uh, in. And then we vent some fuel off and some liquid oxygen into the atmosphere to add to the oxygen environment around us. And uh, then finally, the rocket sits down and you can see the parachute just starting to collapse in kind of that last picture. But then there's a bad day at the office, um, which I'm going to show you a good day first, and then we'll go on to the bad day because I always like good news first. And let's see if this will play. And this is a hover test. Now, this is a team of five people that actually built this vehicle for the US Air Force in just over a year. Um, from being on a napkin to this rocket sitting here hovering, uh, which obviously is capable of vertical takeoff, vertical landing. Um, but that's one year effort for five people to build a rocket like that. And that's a suborbital reusable uh, rocket. So that's a good day at the office. There are about 10 to 15 mile an hour winds that day. You can see the uh, the straps that are attaching the rocket so that it can't fly away if something went wrong are actually blowing pretty good in the wind. It's about 15 mile an hour gusts and the rocket just sits there. So that's our, our final acceptance test before we go out and we fly this rocket. And this is what we wanna send 50 experiments on. Um, and they could, you know, we can handle like 70 U and about 270 pounds. So I get back to my, you know, we fly, uh, people size payloads and SpaceX and Blue Origin fly those buses. And here's a bad day at the office. Okay. So it's actually a bad day at the test field. Whoops. And uh, the amazing thing is we had a set of test tanks and it was our test stand is on the back of our uh, boom truck here. And this was advised by NASA that we should replace our tanks every 50 uses. And these were spherical tanks. They contain um, ethanol, just like you put in your car, except it's 99.9% uh, instead of the 15% they add to your gas and oxygen. And when this happened, this was test 243 on that tank set. So NASA being very conservative said, I'll oh, replace it every 50. That was a $100,000 tank set. Um, and we got to almost five times that uh, before we had a failure that, you know, you can see pieces uh, over at the front of the truck that are still landing, that are still smoking. Um, of course, no one hurt. We're all in a safety clear zone. So none of the material would, would reach us. Um, and even none of the cameras that were standing around had a problem. But this one took a really cool shot. It reminds me of um, some of the Terminator movies you know, where you see hardware in there in the midst of a blast, right? So anyway, that was a bad day at the range, but it was a great day because in commercial space, we can do things like run to failure, right? And we don't have people on board yet. So single string redundancy and those types of things work. And here's just a little bit on Exos. Uh, we actually started as Armadillo Aerospace doing lunar lander challenges and went on to rocket racing planes and the Stig series of vehicles onto the Sarge uh, vehicle that you see behind me here. Uh, that vehicle flew four times. And then we moved on to the new design that's currently was uh, previously behind me, but down here by the airplane. And next, uh, we're going orbital and we're going orbital air launch. So we're going to be putting up satellites uh, from a 777 aircraft and launching from there. So um, really, now is a Q&A session. i uh, love to have any questions from the audience. Um, and then we'll bounce on to uh, some other questions if we don't have anything come in from the audience. Anyone else out there who had any questions about anything you've seen today? All right, there are also some poll questions uh, for this event. We'd love for you guys to get out there and take those uh, five poll questions. Um, for myself, you know, I always love uh, Q&A and feedback. Um, and this, this mission today will actually fail without the help of the audience because we need to get the word out. So anyone you know who might be interested, um, you can certainly share with them. Uh, I. I'll have our uh, support here put info at exosarrow.com. 
uh, in the link for you on the Q&A. And I'm just going to put this out there, info at exosero.com. If you happen to know anyone in the education space who may be interested, and let me get that over in our, if someone can just type that, in, well, I'll type it into the chat because nobody else may know what that actual address is. Um, I-N-F-O at E-X-O-S-A-E-R-O.com. So um, when I got out of Navy submarine service, I knew what Navy stood for, never volu again volunteer yourself. Uh, looks like some of us in our audience are following that theme. Um, here I go again. I'm volunteering once again, so it didn't really stick. Um, I can make the same promise Uncle Sam made to me. If you enlist to help us here, uh, it will be an adventure. And anyone else have any other uh, experiments that you guys have seen that just totally amazed you? Because I've got a whole bunch of them, but uh, I'll pass it off. Anyone else? Well, I'm going to jump into the most dense one. I had a 1U CubeSat come from Space Kids India with 27 experiments on board. So from our DNA to cameras to snapshots to uh, they actually wrote the operating system for their Arduino to control their entire experiment. They actually triggered it. Uh, based on G's. So it wouldn't turn, it would turn itself on off of basically a uh, flat cell battery, but it would turn itself on when it experienced uh, greater than three G's and then start all the different processes as different events happen. And they actually tracked uh, the G force to figure out how high the rocket was. So when it got to a certain altitude to turn on a certain experiment. So amazing. And these are, it's Space Kids India, right? And here they are writing the operating system, doing the control code, turning things on and off at certain different parts of the mission. Uh, just super impressive use of 1U. And that was a $2,500 experiment. And they had six data cards on board, gathering data from all the different experiments they had at the end, in addition to um, some bio data. So anyone else next up? All right, um, let's see, cover the bad day at the air. Um, now I'll ask another question. It's always, uh, oh, go ahead, Liz. I've got some experiments from a teacher in Wisconsin. She already flew these last year on zero G and she's joining our team to fly updates to them this November. So that's pretty interesting. This is a teacher who is doing ongoing research. Her experiments include capillary movement of water in lunar, Mars, and veggie growth medium. Then she's got uh, experiment two, catalase enzyme liver experiment to determine whether microgravity will suppress catalase enzyme activity in calf liver. Then she's got one about three spring systems being secured in a frame with corners covered, weight is attached, experience expected results. We expect a spring system with greater mass to have a slower oscillation cycle and a spring system with increased tension to have a faster oscillation cycle. These results are expected to be consistent with results seen in the classroom. And finally, experiment four is a ball drop, energy loss, in a bouncing ball. So these are four really different experiments all coming from one teacher out of Wisconsin. And we're super excited that she's gonna join our team. What we're doing on November 14th is establishing the protocol for how teachers test experiments on a zero G flight. So we are testing the test as well as the experiments. And this is an ongoing program. So as we see good experiments coming out of zero G then Clearly, the next step would be to start to move these to suborbital flights. Fantastic. And I love progression, right? Um, so what, what's a typical progression for someone to build an experiment and then 
go further and further with it? What do you see as a logical progression? Yeah, so it's so exciting that there is such a thing because they didn't used to be, right? Like it was really hard for us to get our first suborbital flight. We got that NASA grant in 2017 and the launch didn't occur until 2019. And then we got offered our orbital flight and that hasn't happened yet. It has not successfully happened yet through no, no fault yet of our own. We'll see once it gets to orbit, whether there's anything that we did wrong because you not only have to get to orbit, you have to get your payload to orbit. It has to power up. It has to beacon. We have to receive that beacon. We have to send it a command to stop beaconing and start doing what it's supposed to do. It has to respond to that. We have to, there's so many ways that this thing could still fail. But assuming that all of this works and expecting that whether it works this time or whether it works next time, this is the path, then yes, that would be our progression. You're flying stuff on, on zero G, you are ready to put it up, perhaps straight to orbit because to fly on suborbital right now, what we have with Blue Origin is as long as you're doing sensors and Arduinos, we've already done all of the vibration testing and certification on our structure. You can do what you want inside that with the Arduinos and the sensors. But if you're coming up with something new and it involves fluids and things like that, then it depends on what you want to know. And what I love is that we now have the ability, if you want to fly it in the upper stratosphere for a long period of time, we can fly it with Perlin. If you want to send it up on a parabolic flight, hit space and come right back, Blue Origin. If you want to put it in orbit for several weeks, because after this, after Firefly Achieve, their alpha launch and get those first payloads into that very low 300 kilometer orbit, right? Stay up for a couple of weeks. After that, they begin taking commercial payloads up that are going to stay up for three years. And we have the option for ride share. So to me, it's really, what do you want to do? And then let's find the right payload provided because all of a sudden there were really starting to be a lot. And that's that's why it's so exciting right now and why it's really time that we start adding this into science competitions because general public, typical teachers, typical students and their families don't even know how possible it is and how affordable it is these days to send things to space. And we've got to let people know. Yeah. So, you know, one of the universe or one of the high schools here spent thirty thousand uh, dollars, our local high school on uniforms for the kids, for a team, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, but think what a science teacher could do with that. And for Exos, obviously uh, education is one of the pieces that we wanna support because it's self-serving because we're building the engineers that we're gonna hire you know, five or 10 years from now. But our next flight campaign is actually back-to-back -back launches. Um, where we're booking payloads for two complete flights because we're going to fly on Wednesday and then we're going to fly again on Saturday. So we're still waiting on final approval to do that. Uh, we do a flight on Wednesday. We would do the vehicle checkout. We have a one-day vehicle checkout on our reusable launch vehicle. And then Thursday, we do our FAA-required uh, pre-flight checks again. And then the next day, we fly again. Same vehicle. Um, changing out a couple of sections just because of uh, manpower constraints, but literally just take the payload section out, put the new payload section into the same rocket, and then fly it again. And right now, as long as we have the demand, we're going to be doing those every quarter. So every three months, there'll be an opportunity to fly, you know, five, 600 pounds of payload to space and back. Um, so those opportunities are opening up and definitely looking at advancing what kids can do with these types of opportunities. So any other thoughts out there on um, how do we engage other people, other states? There may be some of you on that uh, are part of industry. And we always have to uh, throw this out that we're always looking for uh, funding partners and you know, we've had a lot of luck as Exos. Uh, we had many of our investors who 
uh, did 50% matching for all educational payloads. Uh, we've had similar grants from uh, industry, such as Lockheed Martin, uh, so far, where they have backed um, a, a student or a school payload, and they've paid for half of it as long as the school put part in. And then we've got NIH and all these other grant programs that we look to also use to uh, fund this. So don't let funding get in your way. Uh, we've got a lot of programs, especially in uh, some of those neighborhoods that typically don't have opportunity. There's some great programs out there for those schools as well. Um, so there's nothing holding us back. I mean, you can go sell candy bars and put a payload in space these days. All right, and it looks like we've got about uh, five minutes left or three minutes left here. Would love to hear from anyone in the audience. Uh, if you have any questions for any of our hosts and panelists here. And I don't see anything on the board. We have a quiet crowd out there. You guys got to have some kind of questions. Wow. Okay. Um, anyone else have a uh, favorite experiment? Otherwise, I'll jump on to another one of my favorites. <laughs> okay. So um, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a high school experiment that came to us. Uh, the students thought that thermodynamics would be different in space than they are on Earth. So they sent us a test tube with a heater at one end in the rubber cork, and then they actually had three temperature probes throughout the test tube. And they believed that there would be a difference between that heater heating the test tube up in the Earth's atmosphere as outside the Earth's atmosphere. What do you think, uh, panelists? Do you think there's going to be a difference? And why? Come on, jump in there. Mike, you nodded, so I'm going to put you on the spot. What would be, what would be different? What do you think? All right. Assuming that the test tube is not evacuated, that it contains gas water. atmosphere okay Actually, water, water in uh, all right convective heat transfer would be quite different under zero g than it would on earth's surface uh, convective heat transfer depends on the differential uh density of warm versus cold liquid uh and the effect of gravity on that liquid and because there's no gravity the convective process would be quite different all right, well, I'm going to post to all the panelists. I had a problem with their experiment. It came in a 1U cube to us, and I told them I couldn't fly it without at least secondary, if not tertiary, containment. And I pulled the cork out, and I leaked fluid in, and it leaked out of their CubeSat container. So I sent it back. And this was part of the iterative process that we go through with our, our payload customers. And we had plenty of time to do it. So we sent it back and we said, we need containment. Now I'm going to put you up against the seventh graders. Okay. How would you provide a very lightweight containment to absorb all the water in the test tube if it should leave? Are you smarter than a seventh grader? Come on, you guys got to have some idea how to contain this water and keep it from my other experiments. Take one of my daughter's diapers and use the inside of the diaper to go and soak up the water. Wow, Brandon, you, you actually got the same solution. So they contacted the Loves Corporation and they said, what do you use to soak up uh, or in your diapers? And they said, well, we've got this white powder. And my solution was paper towels and... Um, sealing the CubeSat with silicone so that it wouldn't leak out. And they came back and they actually encased their CubeSat or their uh, test tube in silicone, but they lined the center of it where they put the test tube down with the powder that the Loves company had sent to them. And they literally covered it over. And beyond that, they calculated the volume of diaper powder 
that was required to absorb 110% of the water that they had in their test tube. And they did experiments on that. And I was just amazed because paper towels were twice as heavy as the Love's diaper powder. And, you know, their solution was very elegant. And I would have thought, no, you contain it by trapping it or you contain it with something traditional. And they came up with the Love's diaper powder. It worked great. It was a phenomenal second. And their payload was obviously able to fly on our rockets uh, with their secondary and tertiary containment. And these are seventh graders. They came up with this. So, um, so when you point out a really good aspect there about being okay with failure, because as we've talked about in the, across all the world of engineering, aerospace, that stuff, things fail, things break. And there's this natural instinct that we have that we have to get over the dislike of failing in terms of whatever happens with that stuff. So there has to be this mindset of that hey you're going to have things that break down and you're going to have things that don't work so you have to be willing to go and engineer and design through those processes i mean we've all hear the stories about what happens on the different Apollo missions where they had to brainstorm last minute in order to go and make these astronauts survive you know that's a technique that students need to learn how to do because that's not innate in them and that's a huge aspect of the engineering design process so when you have really cheap launch platforms, whether it be using a paraglider, what we're mentioning about with Liz, or if you're talking about how two balloon launches, like what my school has done and we're doing now with reusing balloons over and over again. Hey, it didn't work the first time. Well, guess what? It's really easy to get on the next one kind of thing. You know, that's the amazing opportunity you have to go and you don't have to hit it the first time. You're probably not going to hit it the first time, but the amount you can learn from that to go into better it next time. I'd love to add to that, John, as well. I, I, I love the fact that it's it's about identifying points of failure, you know, because redundancies, for example, in software is significant and redundancies in, in making sure that what if this fails, what's the backup situation? And in life, in life, being able to understand that, well, what if you don't do well in this? What's your backup plan? You know, and so working with experiments like that and being able to have that ability to understand, okay, well, here's where it failed, you know, but being able to, before you even send it out, you know, what if it fails? What's going to prevent or protect all this stuff from affecting other things? Love that. Thank you. I yeah. would say that's the whole point of engineering, right? Engineering exists because things fail. And the whole purpose of engineering is to look at all the ways that things can fail and assess what are the likely ones? What are the catastrophic ones? And you put it in a chart and the things that are likely and catastrophic, what are we going to do about it? How do we mitigate it? How do we deal with it? That's what engineering is. And it's an, it's an embrasure of the fact that failure exists. And then it's using all we can technologically and in management to control and supersede that. And of course, NASA has uh, taught us well, as well as industry with failure modes and effects analysis. And believe it or not, uh, we sent a failure modes effect analysis chart, just an Excel spreadsheet over to the students and they filled out the failure modes effects analysis and um, it actually came back that one of the failure modes that we identified and asked them to look at, they said, well, the impact is minimal, so we don't need to provide countermeasures." So I was like, yes. So they pushed back a little bit and we did it on purpose to, to say, well, you know, what if your uh, one of the probes doesn't work? And they're like, well, you know, we've got three of them. It's not going to matter. We're still going to get data. It's just not going to be as much as we want. We don't need to put in second RTDs for that or second temperature so obviously love that and uh, uh, just amazing where as adults, we think of these complex solutions and the kids continue to amaze me as they come up with these simple uh, solutions that just, yeah, they just baffle me. I'm like, golly, I would have never thought of that. That's so easy. Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna take a playbook or a play from uh, some of these kids in these uh, junior high and high school, and even the kindergarten kids who uh, wanted to light up the inside of a space vehicle with the uh, juice from a firefly. It's just amazing to me. All right, well, I think we are technically out of time, according to my clock. Um, so I don't know if this session, how this session ends.
uh, our host should be able to uh, tell us that, but uh, certainly appreciate everyone on our panel. You guys were great, uh, wonderful interaction and wonderful answers. Thank you so much. And we're going to close out now. So bye, everyone. Thanks to our uh, audience. And we'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. Yeah, one. bye.